welcome, Yancy. It's really good to finally catch up with you. Yeah, yeah, great to be here. So I'll do a short bio so you don't have to. Um, Yancy, you're, the, you're a writer and entrepreneur. You were the co-founder of Kickstarter and author of This Could Be Our Future, a manifesto for a more generous world, uh, one of Fast Company's most creative people and Fortune's 40 under 40. And why I'm really looking forward to this conversation is I feel like I've been using quite a few of your concepts and your language in conversations, and it's actually informed a lot of what we're trying to do, especially with our community. You, you talked about the dark forest theory of the internet. And there's a few other things that you're doing and concepts you come up with as well that we'll come to later on. But maybe let's start there. What, what is the dark forest and why do you think it's an important concept? Yeah, uh, well, I should first note that the 40 under 40 was years ago. So, so I can't, I, I can no longer claim. Uh, um, yeah, so the dark, the dark forest is, is riffing on an idea from that Shi Shen Lu referenced uh, in his book, The Three Body Problem, the Chinese science fiction writer. And it's about, yeah, how, how we relate to the internet. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 41 and, uh, and I like have a very easy time talking to another human being face to face, but like being my internet self, I've always found to be just difficult, more challenging. And I started thinking about this, this idea that came from the, the three body problem book where, where he, uh, Shi Shen Lu explains this idea of the dark forest theory of the universe. And it's that we look out into the universe, uh, we, we send messages into space, we get no response, we don't see anything else. That leads us to presume that the universe is empty and that we're the only ones here. But instead, you're asked to think about a dark forest at night. If you look around, uh, if you listen, it will also be silent, it will be empty, it may seem like there's nothing there. But the truth is that the dark forest is full of creatures. They've just all learned that it's too dangerous to show yourself. And so the idea in the book is that uh, humanity is, is silly to be sending out notifications of, of itself into space because they're just making themselves a, a victim. And I came to feel like that same dynamic is what we are emotionally and even practically experiencing on the web where if we stick our necks out, if, if we show ourselves, it feels like we're making ourselves vulnerable to trolls, to advertisers, to political manipulators, to whatever. We're putting our identity on the line. We're, we're putting it into the hive mind and making it vulnerable. And so what we've done instead is that more and more we've retreated to private spaces. We've had to carve out other dimensions of the internet, our own smaller dark forest where we feel safe to be ourselves. And I, I am forever struggling with this. Like there's, the, there's such a funny freedom that comes with like starting a new account, a new anonymous account on the social network. You're liberate, you're a, you're a liberated man or woman like never before. And then just over time, as the stakes get raised, as you grow to care, uh, there's just another level of desire, anxiety, uh, just, just, just ways that we get into our way. And, and I think some of this is our own self-consciousness and you know, hyper-awareness and self-obsession, narcissism. But another part of this is that the internet is dangerous and it is emotionally and psychologically dangerous. And I, and I think we are wise to listen to those inklings that say, hey, like maybe being vulnerable will actually make me vulnerable rather than say endearing connection or, or maybe what we imagine the internet would be like earlier on. Yeah, and especially regarding conversation, that it's, I think a lot of people have the feeling that there's a lot of things they feel they can't say or they can't, ex topics they can't explore. And that's really what has started to inform the, what we have sort of called our digital campfire, which maybe is also kind of nodding to the idea of a kind of fire in a forest or something. But there are spaces that we that we need to feel safe to have generative conversations, to, to talk about certain topics, or to to just feel that we're not exposed in the same way. And what what kind, what do those spaces look like um, if you're kind of architect architecting them? Well, one one thing to note is I think that there is like um, how much cultural capital you already have it, like controls how you think to this because maybe you wanna go into those safer spaces if you feel like you have some social capital to protect. 
that is at risk. But for other, you know, I think for someone younger who hasn't yet made a name, like this is a, like that's the game you play um, is, is to try to amass that capital and you're, you're using those tools in this way. Um, you know, I, I think in these spaces, basically they are, uh, they're, they're private chats. Um, they're, they're places where people try out their jokes. You know, they're, they're places where people are more real about what they think because there's no downside, right? There's already enough circle of trust. Um, and, and the interesting trade um, is, you know, you're trading the potential upside of like the, the cultural impact of, you know, something that could have been a tweet or something. Uh, you're, you're trading the upside of that for like the down, downside protection of you're not going to get canceled by saying it. And, and it's a funny math because I think for a lot of the internet, the math has been just like, you, you go for eyeballs, you go for mass exposure. I mean, this is what TikTokers are doing or whatever. But there's a, there's a new math that's entered the picture that says, well, I, I want upside, but only so much as my downside is protected. I, I'm only willing to put myself at so much risk. And, you know, and that's just a function of how big, how powerful these systems have gotten and, and kind of like the professionalization of all tools kind of kind of gets there where like it's fun when you're an amateur, but there's a there's a point where you get good enough or you have to work that much harder for it to keep being interesting. That's like it's why there aren't a lot of like 30 year old crappy violinists like everyone quit when they're 12. They're like, hell no, this is not worth it. And so there's this there's this split. And so a lot of people just like, yeah, they're just making jokes and WhatsApp chats with their friends. And and the, the danger of this the danger of this is that the mass conversation, the primary conversation, then get, just get, gets controlled by extreme voices, uh, players that are looking to gain power or, or manipulate opinion, and really just a lot of extremely self-interested actors. And, um, and, that, and really, the, the, our, our main channels of culture are just left to them. And so that's, that's the downside of all of us going for our personal safety. Like I, I think about the seventies when hippies got self-help and new age and moved out to the country and they're like licking their wounds from losing the culture war of the sixties. And of course that's the moment when like Milton Friedman and, and Wall Street ran off with the world. And so they're like, while we protect our personal safety while we like stay off of Facebook to keep our self-esteem high like, you know, we're also giving up our seat. We're, 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 we're removing ourselves from the arena and so there, it is challenging. It is challenging. The thing that I, I'm constantly fighting within myself. And that dynamic of um, the, the way that the, the social media platforms start to reward certain behaviors reminds me of, are you familiar with the, the article by Venkatesh Rao, The Internet of Beefs? Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, that I found like a really, a brilliant explanation of sort of the incentive structure of these platforms just starting to reward what you might call like sociopathic behavior. Yeah. Um, what did you make of that? And what do we do about it? Because as you're saying, if, if anyone who's not sociopathic leaves these platforms, it just, it just sort of leaves them to the worst actors. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very hard because I think it, it, it either leads to, um, you know, it's extremely decentralized networks where exposure is mitigated uh, but influence is mitigated. And if, if that's all we had, if we are back to like the, the world of the nation state and we all have influence, you know, being the smartest person in Cleveland means something. You're not competing against the smartest people of everywhere else in the world to like have uh, meaning or get attention. Um, uh, that works out. But it, yeah, it's, it's hard because these main channels, it, it's either they're either going to resort to these sorts of outcomes or it's going to be some sort of uh, totalitarian control uh, of, of like an imperfect definition of truth and all sorts of other things. So it's, it's quite hard. I mean, I think maybe we have to root for like um, uh, just that they lose all credibility, you know, <laughs> like there's just a, uh, the, the, you know, people, people exiting out the side doors removes the credibility of these networks to, to the degree that you know, say media no longer looks at them as places to understand what's happening in the world. But I think we're a ways from there. Um, you know, so I, I mean, my, my personal opinion is, I, you know, I, I think that we're in for uh, a dark stretch, um, but, but I think that it's a necessary one. And, and, and I think that there are uh, 
different structures of uh, how we relate to each other that are possible, but that you know we're we're in the dying days of a of an empire at this moment, and uh, and so there is there is a transition happening, and I think a lot of these things are that these are hooked up into the you know financialized notion of value that is at the heart of you know the modern Western world. Mm. Just before we move on to that, because you've written quite a lot about this and it really overlaps with a lot of the conversations we've had to do with game B and kind of potential other operating systems and why this particular one is failing. Uh, but before we do, I'd, I'd just like to sort of get a sense of, do you, so are you hopeful that the dark, for, like that we can kind of use these dark forests um, to have conversations and to develop kind of our, um, to, to grow in a way that we're, we're kind of cut off on, on these main channels? Or do you think that the whole thing is, is fairly terminal at the moment? Yeah, no, I think, I think it will work out. I mean, I think that there's going to be, you know, may, maybe we're going to see something like the uh, humanities switch from hunter-gatherer to agrarian, you know, happening on the web in some weird kind of way where um, I think people are going to learn to federate in, in new kinds of structures. You know, we, we've been like, on the web until this point, you're either like a company or a single operator, uh, you know, you're worth a billion dollars or you're just, you have $10 in your bank account. Um, and, and I think especially COVID, um, you're just seeing a, a, a new configurations of community and allyship. And, and I think that we're gonna see that there is a, a sharing of financial resources, a, sh a sharing of attention and audiences and that, um, you know, the grind of being like the single operator influencer, however noble the cause, it sucks. You know, it's, it's like, it is not easy, especially to do on your own, to write the great newsletter every week as like minuscule as that work is compared to what, you know, actual work can be. And so I think that we're gonna um, combine forces in new kinds of ways. And that like, I'm quite excited about this because I see this potential and I'm leading one too of, 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 non-financially oriented organizations that are at the same time providing, you know, sustenance uh, to people who need them. And that, um, and that they're just, they're th these, these new alignments that are happening. So, so I, I'm very long on that. Um, you know, I think, I think, you know, Facebook and, and Twitter will be like, I don't know, in disaster movies where, you know, once a year you have to go get supplies at the one store and it's the most dangerous run there is and you bring all your ammo and you, you know, you got to go there to get your water. I feel like that's what these main channels are. And, um, and we're learning to treat them that way. And, 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 you know, so I guess, I mean, there, there's things lost at that. You, you lose a lot of the democratic nature, you know, all these sorts of things that sound great, um, but as they played out have, have proved to be vulnerable. Um, and then, you know, the big change, and it's always the change, is that, you know, beautiful bespoke systems, little organic systems come up against the, the massive machines of efficiency. And every single time, the, the machines just mow them down. And so, you know, what is, what is a path where, um, you know, these other, these, these more meaningful places, places where people can be honest and have real connection, that those are not like the indie hits but that's the mainstream. That's something that we can all be a part of. Like that's, that's gotta be the goal. Being like the noble liberal loser, like fuck that, you know, enough, enough of that shit. So there has to be, there has to be a mindset of, uh, yeah, of really demonstrating value and, and creating something that, that everyone will be a part of. Yeah. I, I like, I like that image of, um, kind of post, uh, post apocalyptic zombie wasteland of Twitter and Facebook, but it just, Kind of triggers one question which is how on earth did we get here if you kind of look at the original utopian dreams of the net and the sort of the, the yeah the original idea of bringing the world together and the sort of utopian ideals how on earth do we get to kind of zombie wasteland as someone who's been involved in tech and online it's just a really accessible path to power it's just power you know att attention became power and, and once and once like real world power is on the table, their influence is there. Like you're gonna see every tool that mankind has ever devised uh, to extract it. And, and so I, you know, I, I think it's, um, you know, how, how, you know, could you go back and redesign these things to not have these kinds of outcomes that they have? 
yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of this that's just, that is just human nature and that uh, there is just a, there's just a lot of raw ego and, and, a, and, and, and a lot of raw self-interest that has just been unleashed. And um, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to put that back in. And you, you have a lot of other interests in, I don't know if you, are you familiar with the, the concept of game B and the conversation around game B? Yes, yes. Great. Yeah, um, which is basically a different operate, potentially different operating system for society. Um, and I know from your other work, it's sometimes you've, something you've thought about a lot. So maybe just start by summarizing what, yeah, how would you summarize those explorations or how would you summarize like the failure conditions of the current system? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I so I, in, at university, I studied like literature and philosophy and cultural studies. And I was a music critic for 10 years, writing for like the Village Voice and Pitchfork and places like that. And then, and then Kickstarter happened. And, and I had no desire to be an entrepreneur. Um, Kickstarter was my, my friend Perry Chen having this idea and, and you know, just starting, just working on it, doing it. And, um, you know, being, I was a CEO and being a CEO, being in those spaces while never having any like aspiration to be in those spaces and having a value system that like feels conflict with those spaces was, it was phenomenal because it just made me very aware of what I was doing and made me very aware of what I was experiencing. And, um, and, and really like I, I got to have a lot more empathy for like the hardcore capitalists than I had before because like the, the you know, the, the drive to achieve like the, the ruthlessness of like, let's just get things done, like all that, like you really, you really do come to feel that, um, that, that sense, that, that urgency, which I think is powerful. Um, but, you know, I was in so many situations where you as an executive team face like an unclear decision and path A has like a clear financial outcome and path B has like a clear socially positive outcome and you're trying to decide what to do. And even in an organization like Kickstarter, which is a public benefit corp and is like 11 out of 10 and all like the, the progressive things that you would do, you face this challenge of making decisions for non-financial reasons. Like it feels irrational. It feels in, in those situations, the, the financial argument feels rational. The, the non-financial argument feels emotional. And you get into really hard places where you're, you're sometimes making a decision that you don't fully agree with, but you kind of go with it because you can't defend another way. Like when you come to a hard decision, you look for like legible evidence to justify your choice. Money, finance is very legible. Everything else is, is very hard to read. And, um, and so even if you want to do the right thing, it's not easy to do the right thing. It's very easy to tell yourself you're doing the right thing and to do a lot of bullshit. But like, how do you do the right thing and actually do the right? And, and so I you know, spent years thinking about that and, and living it. And, you know, we changed the legal structure of Kickstarter to, to try to, to speak to this. Um, but I was always working towards an idea of like, how could there be a compass that really lays out what's important, not just for this like short term immediate desire. And how could that compass be something that everyone in the organization would have in their hands and would like, and would basically produce a post permission organization where it's just like, it's so clear what we're trying to do. It's so clear what's important and not important that everyone can just go. And I had several iterations of trying to do that, ne never successfully got it. I stepped down as CEO about three years ago. And I just kept thinking about this question of like, how, you know, how can it be less hard to do the right thing? Like not, it can't be easy. I know it can't be easy, but how can it be less hard? And, and what it lead, led me to think was that, you know, we need a map. We need a map to understand where our decisions have influence. We, we need some, something consistent, something to ground us. Because when you get into these conversations of values, it's just words. It's just people throwing words at each other. It's just like, it's, it's fucking masturbation. You know, it, 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 it's, an, it's amazing how little progress can be made in some of these conversations about values. And, and, and so how, how can they be something more real? And so this ultimately led me to, you know, I, I spent 
uh, a year and a half researching, writing a book about this, right, researching the history of capitalism, especially researching the way we'd settled on financial value as our peg for all forms of value. And in my thesis going in and my experience in Kickstarter had really led me to believe that financial values are rational values that are important to think about. However, there are also other values that can also be rationally expressed that we don't yet know how to talk about. And that there is a frontier of value of defining, say, uh, you know, community ship, defining uh, public knowledge, defining mastery, defining purpose in such a way that we can actually know whether we're making a decision that is good or bad for those things, or, or we can know whether our area is deficient or has a surplus of these kinds of things, but that as long as our systems are all optimized for a single metric of financial value, and we're just trend, we're expecting everything to convert to money at the end, that we will be unable to move beyond where we are right now. And so I, I want to understand, like, how have people tried to define the value space beyond money? And, 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 and I think this is still a very new area. Um, what I ended up creating a, as like the, the tool, the map, is, is something uh, I call BENTO. And that's an acronym for Beyond Near-Term Orientation. And it's just a very simple uh, two by two graph with four boxes. In the bottom left is now me, what I as an individual want and need right now. This is how we represent self-interest today, how we think about it, short-term individualism. Um, in the bottom uh, right box is future me, the person that I want to become, that person is made real or not by the choices I make at any given moment. In the top left, there's now us, the people I'm responsible for and who are responsible for me, my choices affect them just as their choices affect me. And in the top right, future us, uh, my kids, your kids, uh, the future selves of all of us. And what I came to see with this is that every decision we make leaves a footprint in all of these spaces, now me, future me, now us, future us, but we've designed an entire world based on this belief that now me is the only rational space. We're, we're optimizing every decision for now me outcomes. This is why we are completely incapable of creating solutions to say climate change, because we keep looking for things that make now me better, not understanding that we actually have to sacrifice some value now to, to get more at a later point. But we have such a restricted notion of what our self-interest is that we are unable to make these, these kinds of decisions. And, and so what I'm pushing and what, what I'm doing, and then there's a community of hundreds of people that are a part of this, is arguing for this new map to our self-interest and value. And I, I think with the, something like Adam Smith's notion of self-interest, it's, it's a thing we can trust and rely on. I think that's true, especially if we more properly define self-interest as it really is rather than this very you know, limited economic man kind of idea that you know, we've been working off of uh, for the last couple hundred years and the last 60 years especially. And so you know, I, I, I think the bento and, and the shift of our horizons into our collective and future self-interest, this is just a point in humanity's development where this has to happen. Climate change is forcing it to happen. The networked planet of the, uh, of the internet is forcing this to happen. And this is the transition that, that we're going through right now. You mentioned in your book, This Could Be Our Future, that Western society is trapped by three assumptions. Yeah. Can you outline those and, and how you think they could be changed? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're trapped by the belief that our self-interest is defined by what I want and need at this very second. We, we know this isn't true. We, you know, if we, we ask, does the future matter? Yes. Do the people in your life matter? Yes. But we find it very difficult to, to think about these things. Um, we believe that financial value is the only form of value, that everything must, that every decision must result in an increased ROI or it's not worth doing. You know, we, we've allowed a universe of unlimited possibilities to be restricted to what makes a good, what's a good bet to make money. And we also think that both of these things are this natural end, this natural organic end, how things must be, how they will always be. And you know, any any look back through history, of course, says that is never true. Um, but you know, this is the challenge of of systems that are are so strong is that it's incapable to imagine outside of them, right? They they define all the space around us, and so we're we're really in a in a place of of being trapped within a, a very specific paradigm. Um, but you know, but to use the 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 Kuhn the Thomas Kuhn original idea of you know paradigm shift, 
right now we're reaching a, a moment where so many anomalies are adding up about this paradigm, about this short-term financialized individualistic notion of the world, like COVID is revealing which nations have that mindset and which ones don't. The ones that do are, are screwed right now. Um, and and we're, we're seeing so many of these assumptions that we've made. And you know what, what, what's gonna happen, and, and what I think something like this shift in self-interest is, is that we're gonna have to define a, a new reality that allows these, all these broken things to make sense again, to, to make it rational to repair them. Uh, to, to, we need a, a new lens to justify a world that meets our needs now. And so I, I think that that is what is trying to emerge now out of the ashes of, of you know, what I think it will be the ashes of this phase of capitalism. I think we are moving into what we will eventually call post-capitalism. Um, and, and yeah, and that this is going to be a, uh, a messy process, but, but the key the key, you know, in, in, in structure of scientific revolutions, Kuhn talks about paradigm shifts, very famous idea, but he says just as important as paradigm shift is what he calls normal science, which is the iterative process by which individual scientists try applying a new paradigm to their field of study. And no matter how minute or siloed their work is, as people just iteratively apply this new theory to what they do, a real base of knowledge gets generated, uh, laws get made, like this becomes a practical thing. It, it moves out of this political sphere of which side are you on? And instead it just moves into, well, it's just rational knowledge. And then the, the moral arguments move on to something else and this becomes just accepted. And so I think that's the path that has to happen now with value and self-interest. And so I, I think that's what the next, next 30 years are for. And so we've just reached the end of the line uh, of this road we've been on and, and you know, not throwing shade at it. Maybe that's what was needed to get us to a certain point. You know, may, maybe these things you know, do play out in, in certain ways, but, but it's clear to me that, that we're switching tracks uh, right now. Mm. And how much did your experience with Kickstarter influence that and what you saw up close with the, the tech um, world? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about uh, We've had Douglas Rushkoff on before talking about kind of, and, and Daniel Schmachtenberger as well, talking about how tech kind of accelerated a, a, a sort of some of the flaws in the source code of society and exponential tech in particular is kind of speeding up this process of, um, I guess, kind of money devouring the world is one way of looking at it. But um, yeah, this sense of sort of tech as an accelerator for, for, for the sort of the the destruction or the end of this system? Yeah, I mean, I, I have a very different um, feel about it from being inside. You know, again, you know, Kickstarter, like we vowed to never sell from the beginning. Like, again, we like from New York, couldn't be less Silicon Valley. And, um, but, you know, just, just earlier today, I was in a conference call of a lot of very well-meaning, uh, reasonably famous people talking about how to get tech companies to do better. And, um, you know, it just felt to me like a lot of backseat driving um, that, you know, this idea that, oh, if we just wrote things down earlier, oh, if we just like talk to contrarians early on, we'll, we'll solve these issues. But these are very hard human challenges of maintaining, you know, there's, there's so much of it is like loss aversion, like, Mar like was Mark Zuckerberg, did, he, did Mark Zuckerberg, you know, start this wanting to be in a position to whatever, be protecting whatever things he's protecting at this point? No. No, but the ego depletion that comes with feeling like you're losing something or stepping back is like a human struggle. And, and so I, I, I do have some empathy for what, for what these things are like um, that I think makes me look at them as less like, oh, if we could just redesign this and like make people recite the right words, uh, things would play out differently. Like, I think it's, it, it's a lot deeper than that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's just, it, but it, you know, it, it's, it's funny the degree to which organizations really do just manifest their founders. I mean, it's almost scary, the degree to which it's, it's, it's the case. Um, so, you know, we are, we're, we're seeing technology that's a reflection of our culture. We're seeing technology as a reflection of how, of the values we've been raised in, you know, and like those damn millennials, you know, that's just us. That's just like us broadcasting ourselves. Millennials are just like the predictable sequel to baby boomers. You know, it's, this is like how these things go. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm just, I'm just thinking about, 
we're reading a book about how saying how grandparent, grandchildren, grandchildren and grandparents are way more alike than parents and children. So baby boomers and millennials are the same. The current COVID generation and Generation X are the same, and they mimic like the silent generation, uh, like these ones that sort of fade into the background. But but anyway, um, yeah, I mean tech tech is uh, te tech is tech is an accelerant, but it's yeah, I don't know, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to say about it. Yeah. You mentioned that you're familiar with the concept of Game B or the conversation around Game B. Um, one thing that I, I mean, we've covered it a lot on the channel, but the one thing that I find quite frustrating sometimes is this sense of it, it's rarely grounded in real world examples. And I wonder if you, you've had a, a lot of experience in this with different projects, if you could put a bit of meat on the bones, like what are the things that you think uh, that you see as kind of hopeful projects yeah. or hopeful ideas? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think, um, you know, when you asked me what game B was, if I knew what game B was, my answer was yes. But my follow-up question was, what is it? <laughs> yeah, yes, but what is it? Yes, I read about it. What is it? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, so, you know, my, th my thesis is that we've settled on a, uh, a very limited definition of value and self-interest and that we're optimizing every choice through now me outcomes and financial outcomes. And that, you know, probably like maybe 60, 70% of the time, this is the right way to say justify a decision. But in other cases, there are other values or ways of deciding that would be more, uh, you know, would be more relevant, but they're just less legible. They're harder to see. And so the challenge is, can we make those other kinds of values legible enough to be useful and to make fundamentally different decisions in a way that's not about like a moral argument, but it's just about there's an outcome that I want and this is a means to achieve it. So two examples of that. Um, so one is um, one is uh, Adele, uh, the pop star Adele. Um, you know, when Adele goes on tour, her shows immediately sell out and her tickets end up going on secondary markets for you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars or pounds more. Um, but back in 2014, rather than play that game, uh, Adele found a startup based in London called Songkick that had built an algorithm that would measure how loyal a fan was to her as an artist. And they devised a way that this algorithm could identify the top 20 percentile Adele fans in each market, the most loyal fans, especially invite them to buy tickets, putting a low face value on it, and putting no restrictions on whether they could be resold, but that by algorithmically identifying for like who deserves to be there, that it would create a fundamentally different experience. And this ended up being very successful, like less than 4% of those tickets got resold. Fans saved millions of, millions of dollars and pounds going to see her play. And so here Adele distributed a good, not according to the maximization of financial value, but according to maximization of a value of loyalty or community ship. Now this was quite controversial and weird, right? People had weird feelings about this. What does it mean for me to be my loyalty be to be judged by a computer. How dare you distribute something not through price? Like I should be able to pay what I want. This is, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. So I think these shifts in value are gonna be contentious. But to me, that is an example of a replicable, you know, uh, experiment where you're distributing a good, not through a price mechanism. You're, meet, you're meeting a price minimum, but you're maximizing for another value. So do, I think that is a, a literal real life example of like a post-capitalist transaction where you are, are satisfying a financial requirement, but maximizing for a non-financial metric that is even being mathematically de defined. Now, like the, a different example, a non-business example, but just to show why I think this kinds of transition, as weird, as uncomfortable as it might be to be like getting into numbers and metrics with, with like human values, but just to show why it's effective. I, I'm, a, I'm a big basketball fan and, and in basketball, um, there's a three-point shot. You take it farther away, it's worth more points than shots closer in. For the first 20 years, uh, nobody took three-pointers because the culture of basketball said it was like a selfish shot. You know, it's like not how the game is played. If, if a player took one, the announcer would like shit on them on the air, you know, that kind of thing. Um, now, there were people that would argue the three is more beautiful. It's, you know, morally, the three is a better way. It's like it's, it's aesthetically pure. That's real basketball. We should all be shooting the three. And no one gave a shit about those people, you know, fuck off. Like who cares about that argument? And then what happens is that um, someone starts measuring what are the most efficient places on a basketball court to shoot. And the math ends up turning out that the three is the best place to shoot other than a dunk. It's like the single most effective place. And suddenly this fight that had been a political, moral, aesthetic argument 
for a decade totally flipped and just became about outcomes and became about outcomes. And suddenly it wasn't about how beautiful the three was. It was like, well, what, how can they be most useful? What, how can we exploit them to our benefit? All these kinds of things that happen. And so just this way that normal science, the way that uh, a legibility of information can take something out of a moral space and move it into what, what seems like more of a factual space. And, you know, again, we don't wanna be the indie hit. We don't wanna be the sleeper hit. We wanna be the mainstream way of doing things. And so you have to devise solutions that doesn't require like every CEO, every CEO to get so woke, you know? Like if, if, the, path, if the path to a better world relies on personal values changing one by one, you know, we're fucked and we shouldn't root for that kind of world. Um, you know, that's like, that's like Chinese cultural revolution kind of shit. You know, we, we, should, we should root for better justifications and better ways of, of creating outcomes that we all agree are important. That is like the scalable forever solution. Uh, and, and, and I think that's absolutely possible. Yeah, do you have any other, you mentioned bentoism. Yeah. And I think maybe we can show some of the, the, the um, icons on screen or some of the, the descriptions on screen of, of what it is. Yeah. Could you out, out unpack that a little bit more? How does that change? Um, how, do, how would someone use that concept? Our model of uh, self-interest, our model of good decision-making today, uh, like its logo is the hockey stick graph, you know, the line where this line sl slopes up and to the right. Um, and I first had this insight by like extending the lines of that graph and sort of seeing all of these boxes. Um, but you know, the, the bento is like, it's a, it's a UI, it's, it's a practice. It's something you use to make decisions. So the way you use it is you ask, you query each box of the bento, each dimension of your self-interest individually to see what it has to say. So one example I give on the website is a smoker asking their bento if they should quit smoking. Um, so the, the smokers, now us, which thinks of their family and their closest friends says, yeah, you should quit. Like, we hate that you smoke. The smokers future us, which thinks of their kids says, yeah, you should quit. What if we smoke because of you? The smoker thinks of their future me, the older, wiser version of them. And future me says, yeah, like I want there to be a future me, quit right now. But the smokers now me, the smokers now me says, no, keep smoking. Quitting's going to suck. Like I'm, I'm addicted to nicotine. Are you kidding me? And each of these boxes, it has a valid point of view. They're all right. They're all right from their perspective. And seeing them one by one gives us this agency to actually navigate the, you know, the, the many conflicts that we hold, the conflicts our lives put in front of us and allows us to make a decision that is like truly fulfills what we think is in our best interest. And so where we get stuck today is that there are a lot of things that are bad for us that feel good. There are a lot of sacrifices that we know are good for us that we don't want to make and, and are difficult to make. And so I think that like expanding the map of what are the valid reasons to do something or not do something really puts your choices in, a, in a, just a very different context. It, it feels quite different. Now I started this as just like, here's a theory, here's like a thing I drew. And I started using it to make my own decisions and actually found it to be quite valuable. And I started teaching, um, teaching workshops where I taught people how to build their bento, how to find their values, and would like practice with people. Here's how you make decisions using it and, and so on. And so now I've, I've been doing this for a year and I've hosted more than a hundred of these spaces. And in these spaces, it's people coming together. You know, it's, it's, it's everyone from CEOs to customer service workers, uh, you know, people all across the board, all around the world coming together and learning this tool making a weekly to-do list where they write down here are my now me priorities, like my errands, but here's my future me priorities, the, the larger goals I'm trying to work towards, the thing I'm trying to get better at, making sure I take care of those things this week. There's now us, who are my people I need to spend time with? And also, what are my future us things this week? What am I doing right now to manifest the future I say that I want? I can't just wait for that to happen. Like, how am I working towards these larger issues? And it's a way that you ground your time on a weekly basis in all these spaces of yourself and a way that you make decisions and think about your life within the context of this. And, and as you do it more and more, as, you, as it becomes a practice and a discipline, you start to have a really clear idea of what your future self looks like. You have, you, they, they have opinions, there's things that you know. 
And, and what happens, and what I've seen happen with the people who go through this is that you, know, you, you learn more about what you actually care about. You learn more about why the things that have always bothered you, why they bother you. And you give yourself the agency to act with like a true active awareness of what you care about. And most people are asleep. Most people are trying to just get through the day. Most people have no sense of where they're going. And so to have a destination in mind, to have a strong opinion, uh, it's, just, it's just tremendously clarifying. And, and every time you run into a decision, um, it becomes not a existential, you know, an existential moment where you must question everything. Instead, it becomes an opportunity to once again become closer to what you actually want to be. Um, and so, so at this point, I feel like I, I am a year into being a part of and operating what I think of as a post-capitalist community of several hundred people who are actively engaging with a wider value set, a, a wider picture of where their lives uh, intersect, and are finding like real meaning and real benefit from doing it. So, so you know, for me, the fact that it is a a macro sense making tool as well as like a practical daily tool um, has been a complicated thing to wrap my head around and to like try to tell do I tell the whole story of this? But um, but it just it it's it's it makes me feel that it's true, you know, just to see it to see it provide value to so many people from so many different cultures and that they keep coming back just says there's something true to this. And just before we close, I just wonder, are there any other areas, are there any other projects that you're really excited about or think are really worth looking at? Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I think that there's, I think the most interesting challenge that we face is defining this new frontier of value. You know, I, it, I'm, I'm, I'm very influenced by a book by a writer, John Higgs, uh, a book about the KLF, uh, the, the English Electronic Group. And it's, it's a book about the KLF's decision to, to burn a million pounds back in the early 90s. And, and um, a, br a brilliant, brilliant book. And, and, and John Higgs shares um, Alan Moore's theory of where ideas come from. And, uh, and, and Alan Moore says, you know, we, we, we imagine ideas as like thought bubbles above our heads, which is right, which is right, that, that, that is right. But what we don't realize is that those thought bubbles above our heads, they have a door and that ideas from our head can just walk out and that our thought bubble lives in actually this whole other universe called the idea space. And this is where ideas originate. And, where, uh, and, and what's amazing is that the idea space is even more powerful than the physical world because things that happen in the idea space change the physical world. And furthermore, the idea space is so powerful that we can actually make a, a, we can maybe make a guess that it's possible for ideas to be created in the idea space devoid of any human involvement and in that they just occur on their own and they, they enter our thought bubbles and that's how they come out into the world. And the, the whole book on the KLF is a very beautiful exploration of kind of that idea at many different levels. And that felt very true to me. My, my experience with Kickstarter and watching something that you know, we made up like really changed the world in fundamental ways. Like it was so weird to me and, and I felt kind of disturbed by it in many ways. And, but when I read this idea of the idea space and, and, and thinking about what we're all tapping into, that felt true. And so my, my theory, my belief here is that if you can dig into the deepest levels of the idea space of what shapes our world today, I think this notion of how we define self is about as core as it can get. And that I'm imagining my work as I, I'm, like, I'm like Luke flying into the Death Star, trying to find that one entry point where you, know, you could put a drop of red in the reservoir and just change how we see that one thing. And, and, and I think that will work. It's, it's, it's crazy, but I, I believe, I, I really believe that's how things work. And um, you know, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of art and mystery to doing that. But, but you know, that, that is like the vision I'm being pulled on. And, 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 just, and, and in some ways I feel like at all the best moments of this project or any, any project I've been a part of have been moments where, you know, the idea space is speaking through me. I, I'm, I'm just a, you know, I'm just a conduit. And, um, and that 
you know, maybe at some moments our job is to like shut up and listen and 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 try to hear deeply and then and then try to hear what we said as as clearly as possible. And to me, the bento is like the simplest explanation for the map we need for our new world, uh, because all the maps we've been using are irrelevant. They, they have no bearing on where we are now. And as long as we keep trying to use them, we're gonna be stuck. And, and, and so this, this is, this is I, I, you know, I, I just believe in a, in a, in a deep way that I, I intellectually believe and emotionally believe. I, I just believe this is, this is the way. Hmm. And I guess the question that comes up is what is your theory of change here, does it involve each people individually deciding to use this model? Because doesn't it always get superseded by someone who's only thinking about the short term? Isn't that the problem we've got with yes. the system we have? Yeah, I mean, the, the, there's an argument, I think that the entire history of humanity is that there's been like the, you know, the 15% of hyper selfish people that have controlled human history. And the other 85% have been passengers trying in vain to do other things. Um, so I, you know, I don't want, I, I, I want to think of solutions that I think um, speak to that. Um, so yeah, I mean, my, my, my theory of change is beginning with individual meaning and transformation, because I can't just tell people to think something, you know, it, ha it has to provide real meaning to them. So it starts by creating real meaning. I've done a lot of studying of how Alcoholics Anonymous and Weight Watchers work to understand how social change happens. And there's a lot about um, peer transformation, watching someone who looks like you transform to what they want and how much we learn from them, how we learn from learning new perceptions of ourselves from seeing how people that feel similar to us change their perceptions of themselves. And so looking at those sorts of loops um, as being key. So I, it has to start with personal meaning or else no one's ever gonna give a shit. Uh, but the second phase of that is once people are comfortable using this in their daily life, and again, there are hundreds of people probably more using this every week, every day, it's training them, giving them language to use this in their organizations, in their communities, to use like bento language with their families when talking about something, to bring it up in, at work, um, but basically to create it as a shared language, a shared map of spaces we're talking about. This is a future me kind of thing. You know, if, if I listen to future me, it says this, and that someone else knows what you're talking about. Um, the third phase of work, in which is the Thomas Kuhn normal science work, is trying to empirically define these other value spaces. So in the same way Adele is able to discover loyalty and create an algorithm that approximates that, I think that there are projects like this that need to be happening and need to be happening to, um, you know, kind of like what Kuhn's saying, where you're, you're rolling up all the individualized silo findings, here's how it works in my area, this area, that area, and you're trying to create genres of value. You know, hey, everyone working on future us kind of problems, problems with sustainability, you know, the challenges of people who don't live on earth yet. People working on those types of challenges tend to have these issues. They tend to need these resources. Here are things we are collectively doing. And, and if you can create a shared map, a shared language, shared genres of value, then you get mass collaboration, then you get scalable impact. And so, we're going to start a research grant that will begin later this year. We're going to give money away to two projects that are doing this kind of work. And the long-term 30-year goal is, yeah, to, that Bento becomes a, kind of a research institution, providing that personal meaning for people, but it's also trying to pool our excess capacity to fund projects that are manifesting this at bigger scales. So, you know, in the book, I write about it as a 30-year plan. Um, this is the start of year two right now. And, you know, we'll see, we'll see. To me, the, the key metric continues to be, does it provide meaning to actual human beings? And as long as it does that, like, you know, I'm, I'm a believer. Great. Yancy, was there anything more that we didn't cover that you wanted to, to mention? Uh, no, just, you know, pe people are welcome to join and, 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 and check out uh, Bento. I, I do a, a space every Sunday, the weekly Bento, where we set priorities and do these creative exercises. Each one is an experiment. It's normally 60, 70 people from all around the world. Um, and it's, it's cool. It's, it's, a, it's a little post-capitalist uh, oasis. And uh, yeah, so we'd love if people check it out. You can just go to bit.ly slash weekly Bento if you want to sign up. 
Awesome. We'll put the details in the show notes below. All right. Yancy, thanks very much for making the time and um, see you soon. All right. Peace. Thank you, Dave. Rebel Wisdom isn't only about the ideas in the films. It's also about how we bring them into our lives, which is why over the last few months, we've invested in developing the Rebel Wisdom community, our digital campfire. We've launched a new platform for discussion and connection, started regular meetups and practice sessions for members, plus Q&As with some of the amazing interviewees we've had on the channel. So if you'd like to support Rebel Wisdom to help us continue to make films and to find the others, maybe think about joining the Rebel Wisdom community. Thank you for watching.